Like you said, not a lot of practitioners mm -hmm. talk about exercise with their patients. Right. And probably because not a lot of practitioners are exercising, right? So I know if I'm going to be telling every patient, like, do this, do that, get in the gym, go to yoga, find something you love, get that in your life, that I better be doing it too, right? Yeah. I need to make sure that I'm in the gym doing that, setting a good example and making sure that they have something to follow, right? And kind of look up to because, you know, if the doctor doesn't look like they know their way around the kitchen or a way around the weight room, that's a huge problem. When I played varsity basketball, I was that person that was always hungry and I used to think I needed to eat a granola bar at halftime because I felt like I needed it and I needed to eat. I would be eating in the, the pregame talk, right, because I felt like I needed the sugar. Um, but I, I constantly struggled with blood sugar issues forever and just recently and it's, it's been more you know maybe by accident than anything else but experimentation that I've learned that I actually don't like eating before I work out so I do train more in a fasted state and I find that I'm better I feel better the closer I eat to training um, I feel heavy I feel lethargic um, I'm slow like I don't I don't do that well Hello and welcome back. This episode is proudly sponsored by Health IQ, a progressive and forward-thinking life insurance company that rewards health-oriented people, nutritionally-oriented people, physically active people just like you and me save money on their life insurance premiums. See if you qualify and get a free quote by going to healthiq.com forward slash H-I-H. That's healthiq.com forward slash H-I-H. Let's dive into the show with Dr. Drew Jamison and I were talking uh, maybe, I don't know, June or so. Yep. And uh, Drew has been a, a lifelong athlete, collegiate football player, and he was, you know, had recently changed up his personal training program and started doing more CrossFit, intermittent fasting, and, and all this sort of thing. And I th said, Dr. Drew, you know, it would be really fun if we could do like a, an event where we can kind of talk about this from the clinical perspective because there's so many pra great practitioners out there. And I noticed, and we talked about this too, Dr. Sarah, that some people just, they don't exercise and they don't recommend that. So I was like, you know, it'd be really cool to kind of get a panel of physician athletes to, uh, to dive into this. And then Dr. Alana Shaw and I talked on the phone and she was on board. So that, I just wanted to give you the backstory, the impetus for how this kind of came about. Um, so yeah, so I think let's kind of launch with you, Dr. Drew, since you know, this kind of kicked off the, the meeting and so on. Um, you've been doing low carb, You've been an athlete for a very long time, yeah. and now you're kind of implementing a lot of the intermittent fasted, time-restricted feeding, and, um, and, and into your CrossFit routine. So I love to, to kind of, because you're doing an, a glycolytic type sport. So, so recently you do, you, you're changing more to CrossFit. So, so how has that been? Um, how has that transition been? Yeah. It's been an awesome one for me. I'll tell you a bit about the evolution as well, kind of like where I started. Definitely a uh, lifelong athlete. I uh, used to be able to work out five, six, seven days a week. You know, now that I'm working professional, I don't have as much time for that. And my life used to revolve around food, right? I used to eat like six, seven, eight times a day. I thought that was the law. I thought that was the rules I needed to live by. And it worked for quite a long time. But then I also realized like, my whole day was tied up into like, what am I eating? When am I going to be eating? I need to keep my metabolism moving. And I was just like a slave to the kitchen, right? And I couldn't actually focus on the things that I wanted to get done. And I was hungry all the time, all the time. And I was following like a modified paleo diet. And then in recent years, I was like, all right, I'm not gonna be able to train as often, so I'll have to modify that, but I'll also have to modify how I approach food. And getting rid of breakfast changed my life because now I only have to eat like two, three times a day, maybe four sometimes if I work out during that day. And the freedom it's given me, the mental clarity it's given me, and the extra time I've found by doing it has been awesome. So just restricting those calories into a shorter time frame, not worrying about breakfast, having more freedom and time in the morning has been amazing for me. And then just from a recovery standpoint, um, you know, in the gym, uh, the amount of DOMS I don't experience anymore, it's been fantastic because I'm fueling my body in a different way, right? I've revved up different energy systems and then I can still do the lifts I love because I'm a power lifter by trade, play college football. So I was familiar with all those lifts. So the transition to CrossFit or at least starting to do a bit more of that. I know you're giving me the accolades that I'm a big CrossFitter, but story short, I, I dabble with it a little bit now and I still hold on uh, near and dear to the, uh, the power lifts because that's really where my heart is and because that's given me the gift of muscle that has given me so many other gifts and so and open so many other doors so um, can't say enough about that um, I recommend it to every patient like you said not a lot of practitioners talk about exercise with their patients 
and probably because not a lot of practitioners are exercising, right? So I know if I'm going to be telling every patient, like, do this, do that, get in the gym, go to yoga, find something you love, get that in your life, that I better be doing it too, right? I need to make sure that I'm in the gym doing that, setting a good example and making sure that they have something to follow, right? And kind of look up to because, you know, if the doctor doesn't look like they know their way around the kitchen or way around the weight room, that's a huge problem, right? And I see that now. So that's my whole thing of just leading by example and then teaching them along the way. Um, So I'm checking in with that on every patient. And again, can't do it as much as I used to. It's probably like three, four days a week now. But the time-restricted feeding, backloading my calories, making sure it's just all healthy fats, a little bit of protein in the first half of the day has totally changed my life, changed my metabolism. Um, I lost a lot of weight. I used to be about, you know, 2, 205. And for my frame, it's a little heavy. Mm -hmm. It was hard on my joints. And just getting rid of that 15, 20 pounds with this intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding has been a game changer for me in a lot of ways. And, um, yeah, I, I can't say enough good stuff about it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shaw, and then maybe we can go over to you, Dr. Shura. I think uh, one thing that we hear so much about, people say, you know, like, you know, women don't really do well on time-restricted feeding, and it messes up your hormones, and then you're going to get reverse T3, and it's going to throw off your, hi- your thyroid. So um, what have you found with that, you know, with time-restricted feeding and playing around with that? Personally? Yeah, personally, and personally. then with, with your patients. Um, I think my practice is a bit unique in that a lot of the people I see are actually reproductive age. Um, so with, um, certainly with modifying diets, um, I'm encouraging a lot of people to do lower carb, higher fat, higher protein, which I find really helpful. Um, a lot of people I work with, I'm not necessarily doing a lot of fasting with them, um, for that reason, because I, I do find that, um, I do find that women struggle a bit more with it than men. Personally, I, I have found that. Like a lot of the people that I'm working with that are um, trying to regulate cycles, they're not ovulating regularly. Um, so I think that I haven't been doing a lot of that with those people. Sure. Older women, like women who are not really trying to get pregnant, women who are obese, diabetic spectrum, absolutely trying to, to work that in a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, certainly people who don't have a lot of weight to lose. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually not doing a lot of like ketogenic fasting, but more kind of like paleo high fat, um, more of a, a whole foods type approach, more of just healthy diet approach. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because there's been some new research that's emerging, at least from practitioners, that that anorexia and maybe eating, eating disorders um, may be mediated in part through ketosis potentially. So, so, so mm-hmm. those patients that are kind of underweight, you, you kind of refer yeah. to and things like that. You want to steer them more towards kind of the paleo approach but, and get them to eat more, a little bit more consistently, to become more stable. Is that kind of what I heard? Or um, I, I mean, I think it's just trying to get people healthy. Um, yeah. And take another stress off. It depends on t- entirely on the person. So, right. um, you know, it's not. It's it's more for me about quality of food, and um, you know, not that I'm discouraging people from doing what works for them, but I'm certainly, um, I'm, I'm more. I guess if you're looking on kind of the the idea of like macro versus quality of food, I'm focusing more on quality of food totally. in my practice. Yeah. That's awesome. Dr. Sarah, any comments on this topic? Yeah, um, I think I see kind of. Um, well, I see a lot of patients. I have a, a huge athletic group, and then also people who don't exercise, don't eat well. Um, so I have to approach it a little bit differently um, from them. A lot of people, um, maybe athletes specifically, are into this high-carb, low-fat. And then what I see develop is, sure, their body composition might improve or their performance might be fine, but then other things develop, like anxiety or they're not going to be sleeping very well or their hormones and their cycle will change and so um, I have to work with those athletes and shifting them you know uh, f- from a high carb to a more high fat moderate to low carb mm-hmm. um, diet in terms of the time restricted feeding and and women I do think that it's different and I approach it differently with women and and men I don't think um, women can go as long on their fast. Uh, certainly some can. It, again, it depends on activity level, overall health, and so forth. But um, I always try and encourage people, you know, minimum of 12 hours from, from your dinner to your next meal, and then try and extend it. Um, 
you know, I used to be that person or that physician that was like, you've got to get up, you've got to eat breakfast. And I'm much like Drew, I was myself, you know, working all day, eating all day, mm -hmm. exercising, you know, after work. And I was just going crazy trying to get enough food and my blood sugar was up and down. And it's through kind of adapting um, or incorporating more time-restricted feeding and more fat into my diet that I was able to function better in the day both with focus and performance, and so I try and teach that. Do you think that, and this is for no one in particular, all of you potentially, that the body becomes more sensitive uh, to different nutrients? If we start kind of restricting things so it's doing more with less, is that one of the mechanisms that we could say? Because I, I know a lot of people, it feels like, because I used to do the bodybuilding type thing, like six meals a day, protein shakes before bed, like there was just, you know, your whole re life revolves around food. And then now, you know, you can maintain that same level of strength and performance with less. So it seems like the nutrient receptors, I mean, set your, 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 your maxima, your ROI on that, that meal is more. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, but let's drill down a little bit. So not everyone needs to do this element of time-restricted feeding. If you're training multiple times a day or, you know, um, and I think a lot of people tend to change multiple things at once. Right, where they're doing the keto, they do time restricted feeding, they're exercising a lot, they're compressing that feeding window down, and then they're getting dizzy and late headed, and there's a lot of that stuff going on. So, um, as practitioners, you know, if people listening right now on the live stream or anyone here, you know, wants to, you know, make a positive shift, what lever would they, you know, shift first? Start exercising, affecting that feeding window, changing the diet, like we talked about. What seems to have like the most ROI with the least amount of damage would you say I think in my practice it again depends on the patient but if I can get them eating well and eating good food and that will um, motivate them to make other changes and to start exercising um, so I, I start with food just like food quality overall big picture yeah not really get too nuanced with all the macros and the latest keto and everything just like get real food and then just Real, I, I do talk about macros. Um, I, I don't necessarily get people to count macros right away. Um, yeah. It depends where they are. Um, but teaching them what the macros are, w what you need when, yeah. What about for you? Yeah, I agree. I think it, it's it's all in context and depends on the person. Um, for some people, if you, if you get, a, a, get an idea of what they're going to stick with. So for some people... Um, say so their social life is really important to them and the idea of being really restrictive of you know no gluten no dairy no this no that they're really resistant to that idea so maybe for those people um starting with a little bit more of an idea of macros or or looking more at like okay well you can eat whatever you want as long as it's within these guidelines if you get the sense that they might do that and stick with it I find that I'll, I'll start with that. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if, if someone already, if they, if they struggle with nutrition or something about nutrition, but they're really keen on exercise and you can really pick consistency there. I find when you're looking at why people, when people get success versus the people who don't ever really get ahead, I find it's people that can stay, like stay the course with something, find what works for them and then build off that. So if you can get them to follow macros and then you start educating them about the quality of the food, go with that. Or if you know they don't want to count anything, they just want to eat as much as they want whenever they want, then maybe starting with the quality of the food first. Mm -hmm. That's sort of my so approach. Like personalize it based upon their interests and get the low hanging fruit. Yeah. And, and pick up on wherever that momentum is kind of going and just run with it a little bit more. Yeah, and see, sort of see what, what are they realistically going to follow. Like, are they going to follow macros Monday to Friday and then the weekend, like, blow up? Then they're not going to get good results. Or, you know, what can they stay on track with? Awesome. Any other? Yeah, I think I just want to reiterate that the quality is paramount and priority, in my opinion. You do have to kind of personalize it to the person, what kind of personality they are. Maybe they're a numbers person, maybe they're a details person, and framing it that way, they really get, and they're like, yeah, okay, I can do the calorie counting thing. But I feel for the vast majority of people, starting with that quality is priority. Because yeah. then eventually, 
you know, the counting will come. Um, you're going to get the wrong foods out of the diet that way anyway because you're improving the quality of the foods. And then things will sort of just sort themselves out as they go. Instead of jumping into, like, weigh your food and calculate your numbers and get your body fat and lean body mass and crunch numbers, that is one way to do it. And some people have obviously and still do get great success doing that. Um, so it's obviously going to be depending on the person in front of you. But starting with quality, I don't think is ever a bad idea because as soon as you get high quality foods in there, it's going to be harder for them to overeat. It's going to better balance their metabolism because they're not going to have the wrong kinds of oils coming in, the wrong kinds of carbohydrates coming in because you've already given them a roadmap of things to select that from a quality standpoint is a high, high level. Um, so all of you are doing CrossFit. What do you personally do in terms of like pre and post workout nutrition? Because there's a lot of different conflicting theories you know some people say like you should train fasted because then it spikes growth hormone and all that and then you need the pre protein post-workout like there's so many people are really confused right now when it comes to exercise nutrition all of you are very physically fit you know the anatomy physiology the biochemistry um and obviously this changes with the seasons with age goals and all that but just in in general if you could just say you know what for for me you know speak individually what what tends to work for you pre-workout post-workout in terms of staying lean and, and uh, having a good workout. Sure. So again, it's evolved for me over the last 10 to 15 years, but I'll yeah. kind of give you uh, what's worked for me over this last little while. If I haven't had anything two or three hours prior to the workout, I'd try and get something in. So it could be something as simple as, you know, half a banana or something like that. And then what I end up doing is I call it peri-workout nutrition, which is not really pre, it's not really post, it's almost during the workout whether it be a little bit of powdered magnesium, some whey protein powder. I'm a big fan of creatine, huge fan of creatine, actually, in fact, now that I mention it. And we're just realizing now we've been taking it all these years for muscle, but all the neuro... Uh, degenerative uh, degeneration um, prevention that it also brings as well. So if anyone's struggling with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, or just if you want to get like more mental sharpness and mental clarity, it's well studied that the neurons are pretty busy the same way the muscles are pretty busy too. So um, you're hitting two systems with that supplement. So that's a fantastic one. Um, and then branch chain amino acids as well. Um, love that stuff. So that's sort of my peri-workout nutrition. And then certainly after I uh, read countless books on this stuff, um, nutrient timing is one that comes to mind. And they would talk about that, you know, that golden hour after workout. And a lot of this stuff has kind of changed over the years. It's, it's like you said, it's kind of up for debate. Do you go into it fasted? There's some mornings now where I just have, um, you know, the, the grass-fed butter, a little bit of MCT oil, and then go to the gym. And I've had some fantastic workouts lately doing it that way. So mm -hmm. like literally having no carbs and just some healthy fat. And that's been fantastic for me. So I'm dabbling with all this stuff because before I recommend it to someone, I like to do it myself, right? And uh, see how I respond to it. So I can at least talk around it when I'm asked questions about it. I can um, I can comment from a personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, you go into GNCs or Popeyes around here, and it's just wall of supplements, and it's like, where do you start? And I'm choked down pretty much every powder and pill that you can imagine over the last 16 or 20 years. So I know what tastes good. I know it doesn't taste good. Like glutamine plain, for example, like glutamine just tastes horrible, yeah. but another beneficial one to consider, right? Cause it's preferentially depleted during exercise. And then of course there's tons of research around healing the gut lining for it. So never a bad idea to throw that in there as well. But the staples for me are definitely, um, the whey protein powder, the creatine, the BCAAs. And then if you want to, um, reduce DOMS, there's a lot of good research around red tart cherry juice hmm. and just having a little bit of that. Yeah, it's a sugar extract. Yeah, it's a little bit higher carb. But obviously, if you're doing strength training and you're building muscle and you're spending the tank, that's the time to do it, right? Mm -hmm. That's the time to get those safe carbs, those safe starches in and around your workout. And that, like I said, that golden hour, a couple hours there, then your muscles are like a sponge anyway, right? And the more muscle, ha muscle you have, the more you can soak these calories up and the more they'll help drive amino acids into the muscle cell like that whole mechanism is slightly insulin dependent so it's not that we don't want to activate it that's probably the time you do mm -hmm. um it's benefited me really well over the years i'm not a big fan of dried fruit but again like if you're really spending the tank and you're depleting yourself that small handful of raisins in the right person is kind of just enough to to nudge things along and those are the things that i've i've, I've found useful for sure awesome yeah. dr shaw um, yeah, much like Drew, it's been an evolution for me in, in how I've fueled myself. And not a lot of it was very conscious in the beginning. Is um, I used to, when I played varsity basketball, I was that person that was always hungry. And I used to think I needed to eat a granola bar at halftime because I felt like I needed it and I needed to eat. I would be eating in the, the pregame talk, right, because I felt like I needed the sugar. Um, but I, I constantly struggled with blood sugar issues forever and just recently and it's, it's been more 
you know, maybe by accident than anything else, but experimentation that I've learned that I actually don't like eating before I work out. So I do train more in a fasted state and I find that I'm better. I feel better. I used to, when I, the closer I eat to training, um, I feel heavy. I feel lethargic. Um, I'm slow. Like I don't, I don't do that well. Um, and what I've focused more on rather than what I'm eating before I train is, is kind of what Drew was saying is what I'm eating while I'm training. So I found that, um, my issues have never been in, you know, body composition or building muscle or, or, or weight management. Like I've always kind of managed that through my diet, but my nervous system. And as I age, you know, I find that with training, I get more neurological fatigue. I get, I start getting more nauseous in workouts, mm. feeling I get hit by a truck, like with CrossFit. Yeah. That's kind of one of the concerns you see with people is that they, they get burnt out. And so, um, by starting to add in a little bit more, um, you know, drinks at once I hit the hour point of some training right before you start getting into some metabolic conditioning, I found getting that in has actually helped me and um, kind of buffered what I feel like. I feel like some of the peri workout stuff is more about your nervous system because that's kind of the part that concerns me the most is, you know, I see a lot of people that if their nutrition's not right, then they're, you know, they're not sleeping well, they're they're burning out, they're hitting walls. So um, my pre-workout might just be coffee and sometimes a banana and then um, during the workout, like maybe a shake with some protein, small amount of carb. And then after the workout, um, I just, I don't have any kind of workout supplements per se, other than trying to not go a long period without eating. And then in that meal, making sure that it's protein, some carbohydrate, like mm. not like potato, something sweet potato. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Kennan, I want to get to you, but since, since you were on that topic, okay. uh, would you give that same advice to someone that wanted to lose weight? So you said pre-workout, mm-hmm. you're working out really mm-hmm. hard. So the goal of exercise is yeah. to obviously cause some of that damage, and it, it's fun, you know, and everything like that. But but if someone wants to lose weight, we still do need to build up that muscle because where we burn fat inside muscle tissue, right? So is the banana pre-workout, of, if someone... Their mm-hmm. goal is weight loss, right? Yeah. They want to have a good workout. Is the banana going to, even though they're going to have a good workout, they yeah. have this mindset that it's going to make them fat because it contains the carbs. So where yeah. do you, how do you parse that out with, with people? With people? Um, most of the people that I'm working with for weight loss aren't training super that. high level. Like they're going to a class. Um, Meaning so, they don't need that pre-workout carbohydrate because it's just not intense enough. Yeah, I don't find most people are hitting like they're they're needing. I mean, if if they're feeling really unwell, then we might need to adjust something. But yeah. um, I think it's more for people where you don't have a lot of stores to to dig into. Mm-hmm. Um, so it depends kind of on on the person's body composition and then how they how they're feeling. So if it's someone that really wants to lose weight, you know, I, I find you know go get like get your body under stress and, 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 uh, um, I, no, I don't think I would give that same advice. Right. Probably different, different tips. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's finish. Maybe you could pick up on the neurologic fatigue. I think that's a really interesting concept. And we had talked earlier, did a podcast all about, you know, overtraining and a lot of people that, um, gravitate toward that become maybe overtrained from CrossFit or whatever are also burning the needle at both ends, if you want to call it, uh, with their business, with their family, and then they're, they're training really hard, and then they can get this fatigue like we kind of talked about. So um, what have you found in your journey with overcoming adrenal fatigue and, and running a busy business and all that, um, the intra-workout carbohydrate conversation we just had, has that kind of helped with the recovery so that you don't maybe dip into that overtraining state? Um, well, a a few things, my, when I was overtraining, um, my schedule was a lot different. I would work all day and then go and train for three hours after work. So I was nonstop for, you know, from five in the morning till eight at night. Um, now that I've recovered and, um, I approach it a little bit differently. I actually work out in the morning at five 30. Um, so my nutrition around working out has completely changed. Um, but what I've found is I'm responding way better in terms of my, um, adrenal fatigue or, or that stress response. I, um, 
because it's 5.30, I don't get up and eat anything, but I will make a coffee. I find that I need a little bit of caffeine to even just the placebo effect of, <laughs> of being awake holding it. Um, I will often put um, some collagen protein into it um, just because it dissolves easily and it's like I'm still drinking my coffee. Um, sometimes I'll put MCT if, if I'm going to be doing a longer workout. Um, and then during my workout, I will um, use, I'm a big fan of the Zymogen's uh, Zymobolics, the amino acid blend. I'll have that in my water, sipping it. Um, and I actually find that that's enough. Um, I have sustained energy, whether I'm doing like more lifting or metabolic conditioning, um, I'm fine. And then I'm actually now kind of experimenting in that post-workout phase of, okay, well, mm, am I still gonna restrict you know, and wait until I'm actually hungry, which could sometimes be 11 in the morning or sometimes it's nine, or do I really need to like get home and get that, that meal in, in that 30 to 60 minute window? Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that it actually isn't affecting my performance um, at all. And um, my mental clarity is actually better if I can keep, um, kind of keep that post-workout meal further away. Interesting. Yeah. You didn't wither away, you're not just, <laughs> no. Because if you read a, a fitness magazine, as everyone knows, like if you don't have the protein shake post workout, then forget about your workout. It's just you're just going to go into this catabolic state and wither away, and all your gains are going to. Like I, I'm not restricting my calories. Right. I'm not reducing my calories. I'm still getting the same amount of calories in my day. But again, it's in that kind of time restricted, um, and my strength numbers haven't gone down. My my you know muscle size isn't shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'm experimenting with now. It, it, it's almost intuitive eating. And if I get home and I'm like, oh, that wiped me out, then I'll maybe um, eat sooner. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, since the microphone's over there, one thing I wanted to address that comes up a lot is hormones, uh, particularly for, for middle-aged women, you know, going through perimenopause and menopause, hormone fluctuations a lot. And uh, if your hormones are out of whack, I think it's hard to get some of the benefits from exercise, right? I mean, we know hormones play a huge role in body composition, recovery, anabolism, and, and so forth. So where does that uh, kind of come into the clinical picture here with, with people that they need to get moving, but they also have hormone dysfunction. And we know that exercise helps to regulate all that too, but like, do we, do we you know, work at these things concomitantly at the same time or one before the other? From the female perspective, I'd love to get your opinion because this does come up a lot. I, I work on it all at the same time. I, I, you know, it's a symphony and you can't just um, work on one thing and expect everything to, else to fall into place. Um, I also find that with the different kind of decades we go through our, our metabolism, our hormone levels, um, everything changes. You're not the same at, at 30 as you were at 20, at 40 as you were at 30, and so you have to make adjustments um, both to diet. Mm -hmm. And I find in, you know, I see a lot of the perimenopause and menopausal um, age range, and, and I get these like athletes that have said, I'm, nothing's changed, I'm doing the same, and my performance is going down, or I'm gaining weight, and and well, things have changed. <laughs> Internally, you just can't really. Yeah, and so you know, we make adjustments. I, I find you know our carbohydrate tolerance decreases as we age, um, and so often um, toying with that macronutrient and, and getting into more a fat adapted state is better. Mm -hmm. And I know it's it's so personalized, you know, obviously, and we need to test and all that sort of thing. But have you found that? For some women, it's just as simple as progesterone, or do we need more testosterone? Like, if, if, is there any like high hit rate tips that we can offer people, like when it comes to perimenopausal middle age hormonal shifts? I mean, I think progesterone um, falls the fastest. Um, you know, over age thirty five, it just starts to plummet. If you, especially if you are kind of a high functioning, high busy, high stress person, it will fall even faster. Um, and then I do see quite low DHEA and, and testosterone um, in that age group, um, which can affect energy, stamina, muscle mass. Recovery. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, that, that, if I see that, I, that's, you know, um, I try and get those patients to start strength training. Mm -hmm. But if those androgens are so low, and I would maybe if anyone here would, would want to jump in and talk about this, then, then maybe those people wouldn't get the results from the workout, right? So then it wouldn't be a, a, a life-changing habit, potentially. I don't know. I know you work a lot with, with particularly female hormones. So what, what's your perspective when it comes to 
other topics that we were just talking about, hormones and exercise. And so hormones on. and exercise. Um, yeah, I think it, it's, um, I could probably comment on, on the decade earlier than perimenopause more than anything where I think it's interesting is you have different different types of people who may have hormone imbalances for different reasons. So you could take someone who's potentially carrying extra weight on the metabolics, you know, the, the metabolic disease spectrum, polycystic ovarian syndrome, you know, maybe they have hormone imbalances because they're not ovulating regularly for that reason. And those would be the people where I would, you know, really encourage maybe more high intensity training, you know, getting, getting active is going to be your number one, best medicine you can possibly do exercise is you know paramount to you where you or you could take someone on the opposite end of you know our lean PCOS people who are typically going to be more maybe more your overtraining maybe they're doing the wrong kinds of exercise or not you know they might be the people that go run on the treadmill for hours and hours hours and hours and hours don't take rest days don't you know, don't um, nourish their bodies properly. And so they're, they've put their body in a stress state. So those people, you may be asking them to, to train less. You might be saying, okay, I, I need you to focus on shorter, maybe like, and I, I often say shorter, higher intensity, and it's, it's stressful for a short period of time, but our bodies seem to do better sometimes with short bouts of stress rather than this long prolonged, which is what stresses the nervous system, which is what usually affects ovulation and, and hormones. So I, I think, um, changing the types of exercise helps people a lot and also people's perspective on the exercises. So if someone really, it's about, again, finding what people enjoy doing, what brings people joy. Right. So, um, you know, I think exercise has so many benefits. It's, you're never going to go wrong getting people to move. And then also stressing the difference between ac- activity and exercise is that even just getting people active um, is important. And then on top of that, there's getting your heart rate up. So don't know if that answers your no, question that, exactly. Brilliant. But So if I heard you correctly, so kind of this maybe late 20s to maybe 40 crowd would, yeah. would do a lot better, maybe not jump to hormone replacement right away. Their, their hormone dysregulation may be because insulin dysregulation, fat mm-hmm. tissue conversion, creating estrogen and, and aromatase and leptin and all that exactly. good stuff. So we need them actually moving more, making dietary changes to affect then the hormonal axis. But as we yeah. go beyond 40, maybe that could be a time to look at bioidenticals or, or things along those lines. Yeah, I mean, when, when you can't regulate with the, like then you, you can get people's ovaries going or mm-hmm. you can, if they lose fat, then, then they can lose the estrogen. You have more of an estrogen dominance, but as people age and maybe their adrenals aren't producing the hormones, their ovaries aren't producing the hormones, and you know they're, you know, then maybe maybe look into that more. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you were being polite about it, but you, you can refer to like the skinny PCOS. Would that be the same as because we hear the metabolically obese normal weight individual? So mm-hmm. we think about, um, you know, there's this whole thing. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, the obesity paradox. My brother-in-law is an interventional cardiologist, and sometimes he'll go and stent someone that's really overweight, and their arteries are squeaky clean. Right, mm-hmm. and then in contrast, someone that's you know rail thin in their fifties or sixties and is totally occluded in the arteries. So you were talking about like the um, kind of the skinny fat. That's what a lot of people on the street know it to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so that skinny PCOS out of the folks that you, the female clients that you have that ha- that have PCOS, what percentage roughly, if you, you know, off the top of your head? Because um, uh, from the studies that I read, about twenty percent of the lean people yeah. are metabolically obese. They're skinny on the outside, fat on the inside. Mm-hmm. What would you, does that reflect in your practice with that? Yeah, I think that's that's probably probably fair. Um, and with the PCOS population, it's a lot of those people you can look. You you don't need like fancy measurement tools. You can look, and you're seeing abdominal obesity. They might, you know, not be their BMI BMI might not be high. They might not, you know. The, the doctors might be saying, oh, not telling them they need to lose weight, but you can look at someone's waistline yeah. and know. And that's very different than that. And that those people, I think you're still giving them the advice of, you know, weight loss, exercise. The lean PCO people I'm talking about are, are, are actually probably your athletes, your marathon runners, where they have more of a chronic and ovulatory condition, but it's, it's more based on a nervous system dysfunction rather than a, more than a metabolic they're not really falling on the metabolic syndrome mm-hmm. spectrum. So I think maybe then we're categorizing three kinds of people. Interesting. Okay, so you're, you're referring to more of that overtraining-induced hormone kind of issue. Yes. I yeah. see. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I know we have some men listening to the live stream, so maybe we could talk about um, <laughs> sure. 
uh, <laughs> hypogonadism, because we're seeing, I hear from doctors more and more, any more you know, men in their 20s and so forth are coming oh, yeah. in with testosterone levels of 92, like 70 year old men. So, Huge problem. Um, is it as simple as just getting men to like, you know, exercise more and sleep more, or is there more to the story? Well, there's definitely more to the story, and the thing is the educational piece that I think you're just kind of alluding to there, because if, if they're not educated on how this is going to go, they kind of come in a certain way thinking, okay, I just need some testosterone, or I just need some exercise. They try and really simplify it, right? But if we don't take a multi-system approach, because as a naturopathic physician, I can't just go, yeah, we'll just plug in some testosterone here, or maybe some tribulus, or maca, and all that's going to be good because that's just a replacement model, right? But we need to look at a multi-system model where we're looking at the gut, the liver, you know, the fatty acids, the cholesterol is the building bone or, or the backbone for all this, right? It's the building block. And so I show this chart to every patient and I'm like, it starts with diet. It starts with nutrition. These are all fat soluble. You can't just plug testosterone here and think that everything is going to be good and fine because the odd person that tries it, guess what? They come back and they're just like, not any better. Still tons of fatigue, still not, you know, good, good with athletics. And, you know, their uh, ability to tolerate sports is decreasing, right? Falling asleep after dinner. Um, they just don't have the oomph anymore. And so you got to educate them on this is a multi-system approach, right? And sleep is a big one because of the circadian rhythm. And we know that anytime you're treating hormones, you have to look at the adrenal glands. So, yeah, um, this is a huge, huge problem. Like we're seeing in many ways, like the death of man, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. There's a lot going on. There's a lot to be said about this. We could have an hour conversation on that alone. But I'm seeing that um, the masculine energy is slowly starting to evaporate in many, many ways. And it's very concerning, right? Because I'm just in my early 30s, but I got guys coming in five, ten years younger than me. And it's just like, man, what's happening? Like, they're fizzling away, right? So this is a huge concern. There's a big opportunity for practitioners like me and, and, the, and the two with me here right now, like, to really try and spearhead this and fix it. Because, you know, the food, the water, um, right, the PCBs, the phthalates, the EMFs is another huge one here. Because if we're not getting in the cause... No testosterone injection will fix it. You're crazy to think that, but a lot of people attempt to do it that way. Um, so yeah, tons of avenues we can approach this from. Exercise is just one part of it because you want to do those big, heavy, complex compound movements to stimulate muscle, to stimulate growth hormone and testosterone. There's you know, no, no reason you wouldn't want to include that. Right. But when sometimes that's not enough, you got to look at these other avenues. Okay, fix their sleep, fix the liver, fix the gut. Do they have enough omega-3 fatty acids coming in? Um, yeah, insulin's a big one, right? Because that'll you know, crank out more aromatase. Mm-hmm. Um, testosterone will flow to estrogen, it'll flow to DHT. Like it'll, it'll go every which way except where you want it sometimes, right? Because that's not the problem. Right. There's other metabolic machinery issues, um, environmental stuff, right? whether it be the toxins or the EMS, that you got to get out of there. Yeah. And yeah, so you, you have to you know, look under every rock in that case for that person and really kind of figure out like, where is the weak link in the chain and where is it breaking down? So yeah, I talk to them about all that and I try and educate them. This, this is a process. This isn't just run this test, you know, replace what's low and see you later. We got to look at these other, st- other things too, right? Yeah, very yeah. big point. Um, I'd love to finish off. I know we're, we're probably going to have some questions here, sure. especially on the live stream. But w- one thing we didn't mention that I think is woven into this whole discussion is all the endocrine disrupting chemicals that you sure. were just referring to. Because totally. those really affect hormone uh, I- I- imbalances and all that. So I, I see on Instagram, I, you know, watch people in the fitness community cooking and so forth. And they have the nonstick pans. Everything's in plastic. So, uh, you know, we have lotions and creams and, and perfumes and all that. Um, you know, in comparing those, elimination of those products, weighting that with exercise and all that, like where does, how, how important is that to like detox every, all those synthetic compounds? I would say it's important, mm-hmm. but maybe not as important as some of the things I just mentioned, but definitely uh, Joe Pizzorno is the one that really turned me on to this. So anytime we go to the conference and seminars, I always make sure to check out his talks because He's shown a lot with his research that people always think it's, you know, the diabetes because of, you know, high carb, high sugar. But he's made some really good arguments that that insulin receptor is getting tied up by all these toxins. So then you have to crank out more insulin. Then you become insulin resistant for a different reason than we once thought, right? So very interesting stuff there. Yeah, the PCBs, the phthalates, the xenoestrogens, all that stuff matters. Um, For our body, Tim Ferriss, he had a similar problem way back in the day. I read his book in 2010, and he talked about how he came up with low testosterone, low sperm count and all that. So he went down all these rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. Was it the phthalates? Was it the PCBs? Was it the xenoestrogens? Clean up the diet, clean up the water, retested, made a difference, but not as much as he would hope, right? He really thought that he was going to hit a home run with that, and he hit more like a single with it and was like not really happy with that. 
His big thing was the EMF one, hmm. oddly enough. So from an environmental you know, endocrine disruption standpoint, that was the big one for him. So I've been doing a lot of research around this lately. Um, cell phones in the pocket, horrible idea. Yeah. So if you're a guy, do not let your boys down there cuddle with a cell phone. It's a horrible idea. Mm-hmm. So when I read about this in 2010, I don't do that anymore. Because he took it away, he retested his levels, and then within 60 days, tripled Sperm counts, motility, morphology, testosterone levels. It's like having a little microwave down there. Bad idea. What about putting your cell phone in the bra? Just as bad. Or for your heart. So you have a heart there, you have breast tissue there. Um, Huge stuff coming out now showing that's a massive problem because it disrupts the voltage-gated calcium channels in the heart. So you Mm. get this huge influx of calcium, which then just cranks up nitric oxide. You get all these free radicals. Same thing in the testicles. So you have a lot of voltage-gated calcium channels there too. So teacher of mine, um, Dr. Bob, older guy, 65, he's one of our elder doctors. And every time I teach with him because I assist with the manipulation classes, puts his phone right there. And I've told him like five times, I'm like, Bob, get that phone away from your heart. I want you here another 30 years at least and get that away. You need to look after your ticker. So he slips it out of his pocket, um, front pocket and puts it in his pant pocket. <laughs> and I said, now let me educate you about something else here, Bob. Your testicles, that's a problem too. And I'm like, your wife probably wants me to knock you down a peg, but... <laughs> Um, huge problem with this stuff, right? It's, it's massive, and the research is coming. So on my handout, I give all my guys that have hormone issues, that I'm working up uh, hormone stuff with them. It has the, the little EMF spiel. I don't mean to soapbox too much. No, no, but, it's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> but it's there, and it talks about get the phone out of there or put it in airplane mode. Um, they're talking about Ethernet wiring houses now. And, um, man, I'm tangenting so many of all this. No, no, it's good. I, but it's, <laughs> like I said, we got to have a whole talk, talk about this, right? Yeah, especially in Vancouver. I mean, I just checked the Wi-Fi to get the live stream going. I, I think there was 27 or something Wi-Fi signals. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of different Airbnbs around here in Vancouver and New York, Manhattan, Seattle. And, and it's a, like if you live in a cool area, if you're a 20-something, like you mentioned, yeah. um, you're getting bombarded, or everyone is getting bombarded with Wi-Fi. So... What and do you some do about people it? are more susceptible than others, right? Because yeah. we're all kind of, if we're living around here, similar dose. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just like anything, you know, the genetics are different. And some people are just a little more resilient to it. But um, place I live, like 22 Wi-Fis around me. So, like, yeah, I turn my Wi-Fi off and it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm just so. getting hammered from every angle. Right? You can get these things that you put under your mattress to, to try and absorb the radiation coming up from under. That's like... 1500 two grand per bed. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's things you can do. You can paint the walls with stuff that you know, block and blunt this stuff. But anyway, the reason you asked was about the toxins, but yeah. that is a big part of it. Um, in the experiment I referred to in the 4-Hour Body, it wasn't enough. And the big thing was definitely the EMF stuff. But certainly, certainly, certainly from, uh, from a toxin standpoint, get all that stuff out. And I do chelation therapy sometimes with patients if mm-hmm. this is just a huge enough burden. Um, heavy metals is another one that some people can just get rid of a little faster than others because we all have these mechanisms within but when they get jammed up um, you might need to open them yeah. and so it's all about therapeutic order right starting at the bottom working up and then maybe you reach for some of these big dog therapies when necessary right right um, but the emf one is an important uh, health topic that not a lot of people are talking about but it's coming yeah oh, big time. yeah yeah and now there's better ways to uh, quantify it and actually um so your smart meter outside, so your power company is constantly wanting to figure out how much, uh, they want to send you a bill, you know, for your usage, and that really emits a lot of EMFs and so forth. So I was on a plane ride with a, I don't know the exact uh, position, but he uh, analyzes um, electrical deaths, so deaths caused by electricity, whether someone, you know, sticks their finger in a socket or something short circuits, and so he flies all around the country, that's his job. And, and we started talking about airplane seats. And so underneath the airplane seats are all those, you know, because a lot of airplanes now have your phone charger, right, which is so convenient. You can charge your phone or your laptop. But he said that's a huge source. No one wants to come out and admit it. Admit it. But the airplane seats are, speaking of your, your boys down there or whatever the <laughs> term you use, uh, can be really, really bad news bears for both men uh, and women. But um, uh, make sure your patients are not sleeping near the smart meter uh, in their home. So if, if that can be a big Because that will disrupt sleep. Yeah, huge sleep disruption in sleep from this stuff. Yeah, yeah. So he's he's had a lot of uh, cases that way. So um, any final thoughts on some of the toxins and EMF and anything like that that you all wanted to share? Or? No, just um, we'll pass it off to the girls here. But no different for women. A lot of people like take their laptops and stuff there, and we got horrible right 
cycle issues, short periods, long periods. I'm certainly no specialist there, so I'll just leave it at that. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think Drew's bang on with, you know, for, as someone who does a lot of reproductive health, I'm seeing, I'm feel, seeing male fertility become more and more and more of an issue. Um, so everything that Drew said, I think, is important that we pay more attention to. And then for women, um, whenever we're looking at anything estrogen sort of related, where these hormone disruptors, so all the people I'm seeing with fibroids and endometriosis, um, any of the, these proliferative type things, that there, there are more and more studies coming out that are connecting, that, that these chemicals might be related to these conditions as well. Yeah. So, so filtered water, organic food, all that. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that um, Alana and Drew said. I do talk about it with every patient. I think we need to kind of address the full, the full picture. Um, and, um, you know, not just hormone-wise, too, but even if somebody, you know, we're seeing more and more allergies every year. Um, you know, everybody's allergic to something. And, you know, I remember Dr. Pizzorno saying, if you have allergies, your immune system is toxic. It's, it's overburdened. And, you know, I know if I can clean up toxins going in, your body's better able to get rid of um, its burden of, of toxins. And so um, that's been a big, big part of my practice as well in improving I, I mean, I know in my own case, you know, somebody who's suffered um, from asthma since I was an infant, um, my life is completely different, um, living clean. And right. Drives me crazy when people heat their food in their microwave with oh, saran right. wrap. Yeah, <laughs> so many people use plastic in the microwave. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, um, well, I haven't had a microwave for like 15 years, but anyway, it's very interesting stuff. So there's a lot of high hit rate things that people can do. And uh, one thing that I've noticed that, that's emerging in research wise, and we can get to some questions is people that exercise around rush hour and are exposed to all the, all the diesel fume exhaust and things like that. I used to do a lot of competitive bike racing and I, I did a heavy metals test. This was back in like 2004. And uh, my arsenic lead cadmium was like through the roof and like, was eating really, really clean. Um, and I just you know, chalked it up and started to research the chemicals that are in diesel fume and car exhaust, and there's a lot of those metals there. So I think that's something to remind patients, too. It's like, okay, it's great that you're exercising and moving, but are you running near a freeway? Or are you running in your office building or something in, or doing treadmill work, and there's no outside air to so just that recycle there? So, um, yeah, we've been, we've been talking for a lot of great information. I want to thank you all, and then see if we have any you know, questions from any of you, or, or in input, or insights, or different perspectives. Yeah. I did have one question. I think it was Dr. Shaw. I think you mentioned uh, that for women of reproductive age, there were, I think you alluded to, there were a set of, sort of challenges that you were uh, experiencing. And I'm not sure what you were alluding to there. And I wondered if there was, if, the, if I heard you correctly, was there something there that you could characterize a little bit more to help us understand? What what's going on? I think um, what I was alluding to is a large percentage of the, I guess in my practice it's biased towards. I see a lot of people. Infertility is a huge part of my practice, and a lot of the people I'm seeing are are under the category of unexplained, um, in an unexplained category. So I mean we talk a lot about the male side of things, but when it comes down to female side of things, I'm seeing a lot of people with issues uh, related to ovulation, and you know this whole idea of a luteal phase defect where. Um, you know, people, they're, they're, they're not making enough, say, progesterone in the second half of their cycle. And a lot of that comes from um, pituitary hormones and, and a lot of that is related to the nervous system. So um, when you're seeing people who are kind of on that spectrum, sometimes I find that um, anything, any kind of diet that may potentially increase cortisol or put a stress on the nervous system may not be the best thing at that time for that person. So some people do really well with it, but sometimes if, you know, people are, are uh, I'm not, I'm not using that as a therapeutic tool for those say fertility type people. And I have found those are some of the people where I actually do find that fasting may put too much of a stress on their body at that time. So, um, you know, maybe one day here and there doing it, but if they're consistently, um, you know, under eating or restricting their meals a lot, I do find that actually, you know, having a longer feeding period for those people and maybe even adding in 
you know, spreading their food out more does help correct some cycle defects for those people. Figure out what to do, what not to do. I've read a lot of conflicting information in terms of on that. Um, I don't have too much experience with it. Um, you know, I've I've had people do paleo, um, and and certainly most people that I'm working with are like high fat paleo. As far as like a strict keto guideline, um, you know, my my opinion would be if you're if you're hitting all your nutritional requirements. Um, and and she's feeling well, and you know I I can't see why. Um, yeah, I, 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 I yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I I can't say that I've read any literature on it or that I have a ton of experience with that, but um, you know, my my concern as long as you're you know you're kind of hitting your requirements, and um, I don't I don't know if anyone. You have a I would just add opinion. a little bit to that. So Jong Ro at, at University of Alberta Children's Hospital, he studied the ketogenic diet for epilepsy and, and other things. And he's found uh, and, and has published a lot of research on ketosis, but that the ketone bodies themselves help make the carbon substrates for the developing nervous system, central nervous system. So um, it's not necessarily, obviously you want to you know get the calories and good nutrients like we just heard, but... Um, don't be necessarily totally afraid of how the ketones may be. They, they may offer some positive effect in that regard. So, uh, yeah, his, his research at Zhang Ro, if anyone watching or is interested in that. Great stuff. Anyone else? Awesome. All right. Well, um, at, on the landing page, we have all your websites and information. So if anyone want to want to make sure all you guys can connect with everyone, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being here and sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Thank you. And uh, we have some food there. If anyone wants to grab some food on their way out, we'll hang out and network and everything like that. And I really am grateful that you all came out. And we'll do more of these events just like this. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you guys coming.